Hello and welcome to the Apostolic Teachings Podcast. These episodes are usually taking place on a Thursday Bible study night led by Bishop Weatherly or on a Tuesday Bible study night for the youth led by Minister Weatherly. We encourage you to join us and dive deeper into the meaning of the apostolic doctrine. God bless. So here in this next portion is the application We've talked about stewardship. We've talked about what God requires. We've talked about what the Bible says. Uh, but uh, now we're going to go into some application. And with that, uh, it says here on uh, 14, with Abraham's example of giving the tithe and offering voluntarily and by faith, we see the purpose and manner in which we should give. We should not have to be forced to give. I have never forced anyone to do what the will of God says. I have often told you, if you don't want to give, don't give. Because I don't want that cursed money coming in. I know some of you say, well, just bring it anyways. No. When it comes with the wrong attitude, when it comes with the wrong spirit, everything has a connection to spirit. When the spirit's not right, then there's no blessing involved in it. God has never forced you to come to church. Some do well. I have to come to church. <laughs> Put Brother Will on the spot. Mom makes me come to church. What did I do? He said, what I do? You're sitting in the front. <laughs> well, kind of. Oh, I got you, bro. <laughs> but that's because we care about you enough to bring you where you need your help. Right, right. That's, that's why we get our children to come with us because this is the only help they have. Right. Now, God does not force you to love him. He don't force you to care about him. He don't force you to believe in him. He don't force you to do anything. That's just a fact. Because if you're forced to care about him and love him, then it's not real worship. It's not real love. It's not real concern. So everyone has to come because they want to be here. Same thing with your tithes and offerings. The reason why Abraham was blessed is because he came with heart and a mindset. Mm -hmm. He looked at what God had given him. Does anybody know what happened on that day that he gave to Mount Chesedek? Anybody in Bible scholars here? He had fought the five kings. And if you go back, you'll find out that Lot had been taken right. captive. Right. And his uncle uh, went to go take care of business for him. Mm -hmm. When, honestly, he would have never been in that situation had he never been taken in the first place. Mm -hmm. Amen, somebody. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we go, we shouldn't be there. Yeah. Amen. Well, let me say it again. Sometimes we go, we shouldn't be there. God said, I want you to leave your father's house. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Meaning all of that junk is being taught there. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. Their ways of all of their ungodliness. I want you to leave your father's house and go into where I'll show you. Right. Right. I want you to separate yourself from ungodliness to follow God. Right. Yep. And he decided to take some company with him. That's what we do sometimes. We get some, we sat up next to people because we think, well, you know, I have company. Mm -hmm. Sometimes your company is your detriment the rest of your days. Yep. And you'll find that when you do it your way instead of God's way, there's a penalty to pay. Mm -hmm. And Lot got him in trouble a lot. So, um, first off, 
let's make sure that what we're doing is what God wants us to do. Amen. Right. Okay? Now, when he fought those kings and he took all of the possessions, he had lots of things that he had gained. Okay? That's the point. He had gained. I've mentioned this before in, in days gone by. Is look at yourself. Your situation. When you came to God. Let me use Sister Wilson. Williams to see what she got to say. When you came to this church eight years ago. How much was you making? Which, 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 did you have a salary then? You were living off of your mother and father. Or, right? I mean, that's basically, you, you had no real stability of your own. And now, eight years later, a new beginning. <laughs> she has her own apartment. She has her own job. She has her own car. She has her own freedom, her own life. Hey, how how quick do you want to move back into your parents' home? <laughs> well, if you're on this podcast, you're you're not getting the full depth of what's being going on in the sanctuary because she's uh she's she can't even she's got a laugh going to where <clears throat> I'm gonna say it looks like negative. <laughs> she doesn't want to go back to living at home. Uh, there's a freedom. <laughs> you can sleep all day if you want to sleep all day. You know. But uh, the point is, is you have to look at yourself. When you got here, what was your life like? And then look at your life right now. Are you, are you, do you have more money coming in? Do you have more peace in your home? Do you have more things? Do you have more food? Whatever. You have to take a moment and think about how much you gained from the time you started this journey. And he had been in this battle and won and had gained all kinds of extra things that he didn't have before he started the battle. Anybody been in the battle? I guess no, but got one person. Anybody else been in the battle since you started here? <laughs> and you're doing better now than you was then? How is your relationships? They're a lot better now. So the part here is Abraham was not forced to give. But because the abundance that he recognized God had given him, he wanted to give God back and show God, I thank you for allowing me to increase where I am now. I look at when I left my father's house, didn't have anything. I was, didn't have a home, <laughs> didn't have anything really to talk about of my own. But now I've got cattle galore. I just won this battle with the help of the Lord. And now I have all this stuff from these other places. And God, I just want to give back to you. He said, uh, we should not be forced to give. But we should give because the, of our love for God and the desire to recognize him as what? Before the law of Moses was given, Abraham gave not an estimate, but a tenth. Hmm. Let me just stop right there. Now, when you're looking at that, what does that say to you? Abraham gave what? What? Where's my pointer? I don't have my pointer. Is that my pointer? There you go. Put that up there. Gave, Abraham gave not an estimate. What does an estimate mean? I guess. He didn't guess it was. He calculated. 
he didn't just decide this is what I think I should give. But I lost everything. It's not left up to your discretion if we're going to be biblical. It's not left up to your discretion to decide how much you should or could give. I have a lot of people over the years that have asked me, well, should I give it even when I don't have it? And I will tell you, you should give it. If I don't have it, yes. Why? Because if you don't, you're cursed. According to the Bible. We read through all that. You're cursed with a curse. Well, what happens if I have a bill come due? First off, trust God. And then if you can't get things taken care of, come see the man of God. I've done it many times. People that were faithful with their tithes and offerings and said, hey, I paid my tithes and offerings, Pastor, but I've got a light bill. You know what I tell them? Bring me the light bill. Bring it to me. I'm going on to pay for it. I know I just lost everybody. No, I heard. I've done it here in this church. I got a phone bill. Bring me the phone bill. I'll go make a payment. Why? I would rather you pay your tithes and give your offerings and be blessed to God than not do it and be cursed. I've had people that did what they were supposed to do. I don't have anything to eat. Let me know. I'll get you something to eat. Why? Because I'm going to bless you. I'm going to help you. But if you never try God, if you never put him to the test, if you never put him to the test, you'll never know. Say, well, I've done all that, but I'm still not ahead. I don't have extra. Well, let me tell you something. We, we gain it by money. Okay. I got a check in the bank. No. How about people that I've watched that didn't pay their tithes? Now listen. People that haven't paid their tithes and have got sick and couldn't work for a week right afterwards. They kept their they kept their money, but they got so sick they couldn't work for a week. Then they're really in trouble. Because then they didn't have a check coming in either. See, we, we think we want a check in the mail. I need a I want a hundred and fifty dollar check just dropping my account. Somebody give me extra money in my account. That ain't the way it works. Maybe it keeps you from your car breaking down. Well, I owed $150 ties. But now I got a $500 thing to fix my car. Somehow we figure out how to fix that car. Because we got to go to work. But I wonder if it would have happened had you done what God said to you. Yes, you got a question. And God also blesses us spiritually. A lot of times we don't I, I hadn't got there. You're, you're ahead, of the, ahead of the horse. But go ahead. You know, it's, it's not the exact same. But Solomon... When he prayed to God, he you're, prayed you're, for, you're ahead of the horse. <laughs> you're ahead of the cart, I should say. He, 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 prayed, he prayed for God wisdom. To right and wisdom. He said, God, give me wisdom. That's what he prayed for. God, give me wisdom. He didn't ask for money. He didn't ask for a long life. But God said, because you're asking for the right thing, mm -hmm. I'm going to give you the money right. and, and the long life. And if sometimes we would pray over our time before we put it in, because that's what you told us to do, is pray over that God bless us. Maybe instead of just saying, Lord bless us. And, and, and some, do you know that I pray over your ties? Mm -hmm. God bless them a hundredfold. Now that hundredfold may not be dollars. It may be keep the family healthy. Mm -hmm. yeah. Keep them from going to the hospital and spend, anybody have a hospital bill? They're free, right? When you go to the hospital, they give you free health care. No, they're over here calling me. Leave me alone. But we 
don't count that as being blessed when he keeps us healthy. <laughs> Somebody said, well, I've been sick. Yeah. You know what that's for? To remind you who keeps you healthy. Mm -hmm. To remind you who is the healer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got to go on. I got to go on. So you can't be forced to do it. It has to come from the abundance of your heart. And you can't estimate. You can't say, well, I think I could do it today. But next week, I'm going to be in such a pinch, I can't do it. God likes consistency. You want him consistent, right? Mm -hmm. When you call on him, you say, Lord, I want you right now. You want him to go in right now. What if you call on him, I need him. Lord, I need you. I'm getting ready to go off the edge of this cliff, Lord. This car is not stopping. He's like, uh, I'm busy right now. I usually am consistent, but I haven't been the last few times of your trouble, so, you know, just maybe I'll get to you, maybe I won't. God's always there for us. Constant. Has he ever really failed you? Let me ask you a question. Has he ever failed you? Can you point to something saying, God failed me here? Nope. I'll wait. <laughs> Give somebody time to think. I failed him over and over again, but I've never had him fail me. Mm -hmm. Never. There's probably moments where we felt like that. We felt like it. But when you turn the page of your life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you were here, you didn't have nothing. Anybody been without uh, heat in your home? <laughs> yeah. Okay, how about no water? Yep. Been there. Car broke down? Oh, yeah. But, but let me just ask you, just like this right here, you turn the page. Let's say, when was that? You know, a few weeks back, a month back, whatever. Two months back. You turn the page and guess what? You're here. <laughs> you got water. <laughs> you got heat in your house. <laughs> you got food at the table. So obviously he came through. It ain't all I wanted, no. But how much all of you give it him? Pastor, what have you given him? Have you given him everything? Well, I paid my tithes and gave my offering. Yep. Yeah. What about yourself? Now we're getting into another area. <laughs> tithes and offerings are specific to the increase. What about your 24 hours of your day? Do we give them two hours and 40 minutes of our day dedicated to God? <laughs> well, that's a different thing. Now, wait a minute now, Pastor. We, we already have a hard enough time with the money thing. Now you go, now you're going to bring in, that's what stewardship is. I come and I give myself the Lord. What's that mean? The house of the Lord is important. Mm -hmm. Do you come spend a couple hours every day? Mm, probably not. But it keeps you healthy anyways, or it keeps you going. Mm -hmm. So, there's a lot more than just what meets the eye. Stewardship is deeper than some dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. Stewardship is about a whole person. Stewardship is not just about what you served. Right. It's about your attitude. Oh, Lord Jesus. Yeah. A servant doesn't have an opinion. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A servant and a slave are in the same boat. Yeah. If you look it up, you, see, you search it out. A slave was told, get up and come right now. Mm -hmm. And he did. Servants are told, get up and go see about the master. And they get up and do it. Yep. They don't have an opinion like, well, you know, I want to sleep in. 
I don't really feel like it. See, can you tell him I'm busy right now? That's not a servant. That's not a, well, I don't want to be a slave. Okay. Take care of yourself. Take care of your own life. Watch it fall into the shambles. So, he wanted to recognize him, and he didn't, he didn't try to estimate, but the tenth, his response was voluntary by and by faith, that when I do this, I'm going to believe God. See, that's where it really boils down to. When we don't serve the Lord with all of our heart, all of our mind, it's not a lack of God. It's a lack of our faith. Can you turn this down just a little bit? Because I'm hearing a little ringing. When we don't believe God. Anybody know what the Bible says about faith? Without faith what? Without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must first believe that he is. Mm -hmm. And that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Mm -hmm. So, if you don't really believe God, it proves. Now, I believe God, but not enough to follow his word. Mm -hmm. Because not paying tithes and not giving an offering and not being a servant attitude in the church. And not just in church, but to your fellow man. That's a lack of your faith. Because you don't believe God's really going to do what he said in this world. Mm -hmm. And when we give, we give out of necessity mm -hmm. instead of out of our love. Right. Right. You have the opportunity to show God how much you love him. Mm -hmm. Financially and physically. You have an opportunity to be a servant unto him and show him, Lord, I believe you. I'm going to work. There are people that, I've seen something on, on uh, YouTube. I think it was YouTube. One of those things. And it was saying people that have excuses don't really have excuses. There was a man in a very large sanctuary. He had one leg. And he had the vacuum. That's what he did in the church. He vacuumed the sanctuary. However said every, every day, every other day. With one leg. One leg. And... <laughs> A lot of times we make excuses why we can't do something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't know. You're making excuses. Because we can do uh, we can do everything we want to do. Mm -hmm. I just don't have the time. But you have the time to do what you want. Right. Pastor, I thought this was going to be good stuff. It is. See, when you get a hold of this, when you really get a hold of it and believe God, that's when you'll see the miracles. That's when you'll see things open up for you. But the biggest part of our problem is we don't have faith and we don't believe. Because when you believe something, you don't, look, has anybody ever rode a roller coaster? Do you like them? Did you believe you're going to crash? Uh, once, yeah. So every time you went up there, you believe you're going to crash? No, no, no. Just oh, no, no, no. I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get a point across here. Now, if you didn't believe that that thing was safe enough to take, you wouldn't get on. Right. But you have no idea. And there's people who are dead today. But they believe that. They believe when they got in and they latched them. Okay, I'm safe now. Tell that to young man that fell out of that thing. It was like, <laughs> here not long, a year or two ago, whatever, young man, 15, 16 years old, they didn't latch him in and he fell. Fell out of it. Yeah. You'll believe that, but we won't believe God. That He said in His Word, if we do this and this, He would bless us. 
If we would give ourselves unto him, he would bless us. So let me move on. I might lose everybody before it's over. <laughs> before the law of Moses was given, Abraham gave, not as an estimate, but a tenth. His response was voluntary by faith. God gave the law to teach. What's it say? What? He gave it to do what? Teach people their errors. Romans 3 and 20. Does anybody know what that says? Anybody got your Bible there close? Just well, they probably pull it up. 3 and 20. All right. All right. Sin became evident by the law. Through though we no longer live under the law, we should not forget the teachings of the law. The law teaches us principles that are part of eternal, the eternal will and character of God. We're not under them, but they are schoolmasters. One part of the Bible tells us that the Old Testament is how we learn what God requires. The only difference is the law, we were supposed to be forced to do it. You didn't have a choice. Say that big and loud. Now it's a heart issue. Now it's a heart issue. 1,000%. 1,000%. He said, I'm going to take and write these laws on your heart. I'm going to put them on the inside of you to where they're not something that you see on a tablet of stone, but somewhere in your heart, it connects with you. Go ahead. And I want to mention something because and I've, talked, I've talked to you about it. You know, people have said in the past that there's research that's coming out that's saying, well, the law wasn't practiced as much as we believe it was. But we can say the exact same thing about this very same generation. Right. We have what we're supposed to do. Right. We have our heart's law, as you just said. But just because everyone doesn't practice doesn't mean it's still not in the Right, it's not about. So what he said was that there are researchers, researchers that say that even Israel did not follow the law like we say they did. But that is true to a certain extent because they kept going into captivity. They kept going into bondage. And you know what else? It's still happening today. Because people are going into bondage today because they're not following God's law. They're bound in sin and don't even know they're there. Locked in something that they don't even maybe know how to get out of now. Because they didn't believe God. If your ways please God, He'll open up things for you. He'll make things work for you. Well, not one person, I guess, maybe two. All right. The law required people to give, making this a matter of obedience. It was no longer left to, dis to their discretion. Now, anybody know what that means? Not left to their decision or choice. Making this a matter of obedience. What's that next portion say to give is to obey so when Saul was told uh, to kill everything he was there I think Agag was the king and he said kill everything animals everything just get rid of it it's not God's stuff get it wipe it out the one thing that has a spirit in it is not like God what well, my animals? Yeah. Yeah. Everything. When he said everything, he meant everything. Yep. He meant get rid of anything that's not like God in your life. Right. Right. And so Saul thought, well, you know, I'll keep some of the good stuff, the, like the, the best of the animals. <laughs> you know. I'll keep the good stuff. 
but I'm not going to get rid of everything in my life. Sometimes we think we can only, we only need part. But we don't need everything from God, just what we want. And that's where the, that's where the problem comes in. He was told to eradicate everything that wasn't like God. And so God rejected him. So, obedience, the Bible, the reason why I said the scripture says, he, he asked him, you know, as soon as the preacher comes, he says, oh, blessed are the Lord. Hey, preacher, I've done all the Lord requires. And I'm saying my words, but Samuel said, really? Why do I hear the lowering of the sheep? I mean, of the oxen and, and the bleeding of the sheep. Why do I hear these noises? Of these animals if you did everything I told you to do. Well, the people. Uh, you know, it was the people. They're, they wanted me to keep this stuff. It's always somebody else's fault. So, the Bible says there, Samuel tells them, obedience is better than sacrifice. Doing what you're told is better than what you say what you want to give. I want to give just this much. I, want to, I, I only want to be a partaker this much. When obedience should be obedience means everything has been told you. But we don't like to be obedient. Anybody know what obedience, what happens with stubbornness and rebellion? It's like witchcraft. It's witchcraft. According to the Bible. You don't believe that, do you? She just looked kind of crazy. She's like, what? That's in the Bible, sis. It's in your Bible. Everybody got a Bible? It's in your Bible. <laughs> when you rebel against the nature of God, ain't no different than being a witch, warlock. That's real. That's real. There's evil spirits. And it's better just to obey God. It's just better to obey God. Before, uh, before God made the tithe a law, it was already a basic principle and foundation in a person's relationship with God. As a divine principle, it is still in effect even after the law. Faith teaches the simple or the same principle in another manner. Obedient ones give because they love. Not what? The not through the force of the law. Today we do not practice faithful stewardship to receive what? Salvation. As they did in the Old Testament under the law. Instead we what? Practice, practice, practice faithful stewardship because we have what? We've received salvation by grace. We're trying to show God. We're trying to show God. <clears throat> Over here on the, this is the New Testament stewardship. Now we've covered old, now we need to cover the new. <clears throat> the key verse here, and the Lord said, who then is that faithful and wise steward? Whom is, uh, whom his Lord shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? The lesson goes to understand stewardship <coughs> as seen in the New Testament. What have I learned? Boy, that's a loaded question. In the New Testament, the giving of tithe and offering was what? Continued. A lot of people want to argue the fact and say that was a, a, a law. That's what they want to do is say it was a law. But it continued on. We're going, we're going to cover this. What's it say? Jesus and the religious leaders of Israel upheld the New Testament practice of giving tithes and offerings. Matthew 23 and 23. Can we go there? Somebody got it in your Bible? Or Sister Weber got it probably. Now, I have a good friend of mine. Uh, I've mentioned his name many times, Joe Batet. He is a Levite from the family of Levites. His mother and father were 
uh, born and his self and his brother as well in Israel. His mother and father fought in the Six Day War. If anybody does history, that's when all the nations attacked Israel at one time. And God delivered them. That was in 1967. There's all kinds of accounts. It's really interesting if you'll go on the internet and you'll look. There's actual footage and, and conversations. In 1964, the leader of those that were coming against Israel. Now, this is three years prior to the attack. This man that they picked to be their leader, unbeknownst to them, was a Jew. But he came out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, Makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's in there. My friend, the Jew, Joe, showed me these things on the internet. He said, you got to see these things. Three years, they were planning for the attack before it ever happened. And the one that was leading the attackers was really a Jew at heart. His family. Even though he had been moved to Israel, I mean, moved to Egypt and been raised up, he still had a connection and he set them up for failure. You can't, you can't fool with God. God's got people in the bush. He's got a lamb, a ram in the bush. All right. What's it say there, sister? Uh, we, got, we got that up there. Yep. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Man, that's a mouthful. Wait a minute. Scribes and Pharisees are what? Hypocrites. But who are they? The religious leaders of the day. Religious leaders of the day. He called them hypocrites. For ye pay tithes of mint and anise and cumin. And what? Judgment, mercy, and faith. Here we go back to faith. These what? Uh, Wait a minute. What, what are these things? Ought you have done? What things? Law, judgment, mercy. No, no, no. Go back. These ought ye to have done and not to leave the others undone. What were the ones that supposed to have done? Tithes. Uh -huh. Tithes and, uh, uh, you know, for the men. And that's the cumin. The tithing part is what he's saying. You should do that and not leave the other. Judgment, mercy, and you can't leave them undone. You gotta do them all. Right. You gotta do what's right. You gotta pay tithe, give offering, but you gotta have judgment, mercy, and faith. Without faith, you can't please God. Faith is believing that God's gonna take care of you. Did he say he would take care of you? Does this work? Do you believe his word? If we don't believe his word, then what are we doing here? Mm -hmm. right. We have to believe what we believe. And don't doubt what you believe. Because either God's going to take care of you, ain't. You have to make that decision in your mind. Because if you don't believe that, then you're never going to get anywhere. Because you can't please God. Mm -hmm. If you think that you're going to make it to heaven not pleasing God, you got another thing coming. How are you going to be at, at odds with God and him say, okay, that's all right. Come on, anyways. Huh. Does anybody know who Enoch was? We talked about this yesterday. Enoch? Enoch, yeah. Who was he? Um, How many generations from Adam? Five? Seven generations. Seven, okay. What does he represent? Completion. He represents the church. Seven generations from Adam. We are in what dispensation now? In the seventh dispensation. What was his testimony? That he walked with the Lord. That was the first one. And then another portion of scripture says, and his testimony was that he pleased the Lord, so he was no more. God translated him. That's what the church is supposed to do. We're supposed to walk with the Lord. And in time, God, if we please him, we'll be translated. So how can you please the Lord if you don't have 
Thank you. He said, hey, look, even the sparrows, I take care of them. The grass in the field, aren't you more than a sparrow? Aren't you more than some grass? What we got to really understand. So, uh, he said, you blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. What's the next one say? <coughs> Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean what? The outside. The outside of the cup and what? And the platter, but what? Your spirit is wrong. What was extortion and excess? Stealing, essentially. Taken what is not yours. Yep. And you want excess to have all that you want. But look the part on the outside. See, you look good on the outside. You come to church, you wear clothes, you look nice. We clap when we're supposed to clap. We raise our hands when we're supposed to raise our hands. Mm -hmm. We tell each other, hey, praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. We tell each other to love you. But we're not going to obey what God said to do in the Word. Mm -hmm. So your outside looks nice, but the inside hasn't changed. Right. He said, you're nothing but whited sepulchers. Yep. Anybody know what a whited sepulcher is? Come on, somebody. Anybody know what white sepulchers? It's a grave that's painted. Yeah, it's whitewashed. That's it. Whitewashed. It's whitewashed. It looks good on the outside, but he said it's full of dead men's yeah. bones. Mm -hmm. That's right. Death on the inside. That's it. And you ain't getting nowhere having death on the inside. All right. Let's go back to that, Sister Weatherly. As clearly seen in the epistles, the early church practiced the Old Testament plan of giving, Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 9, 7 through 14, 1 Timothy 5 and 18, and Hebrews 7, 5 and 9. I want, I want somebody, who'll get me, uh, so we don't have to keep jumping back and forth, who'll get me uh, 1 Corinthians 9, uh, 9 and 7? Somebody want to find that? All right. And somebody else find me uh, 1 Timothy 5 and 18. You got that, Sister Williams? Yes. Yeah. All right. I'll grab Hebrews. Hebrews 7, 5 through 9. All right. You ready, Sister? Uh, yes. All right. Let me, this is 1 Corinthians 9, 7 through 14. Who goeth a, war, a warfare any time at his own charge and house of the Lord. And he said, who plows the field and doesn't eat out of it? That's what I was telling y'all the other day when we were covering some of this. It had it in another portion of scripture and we, we read it. You go to work every day and you expect a paycheck. But why does it change when it comes to the man of God? I preach here at least twice you know, a week. Yeah. I've been doing it for eight years. This is a new beginning. February is our eighth year, isn't it, Sister Williams? I think it's eight years. Shouldn't I get a paycheck? You want our money? No, I want the money to come to the house of the Lord like it's supposed to so the church can be blessed. 
Not about me. Because unless the Lord tells me something different, it's going to stay the same as it is now. The money goes to the church. You're not going to be one to tell me, well, I'll just cut you off and you'll quit preaching once you're full preaching. No, you ain't going to hold me like that. You can keep the money. The church can keep the money. I don't need it. Well, it's quiet. Blessed quietness. Holy quietness. What assurance in my soul. On the stormy sea, Jesus speaks to me. And the billows seem to roll. I am not looking to fill my wallet. I'm looking for the church to be blessed. And the church cannot be blessed if the church folks don't be obedient to the word. You, you know, that's the thing that people think, they get in, the, in their minds when you start preaching about this, like, oh, he just wants to get rich. He just wants to drive a Cadillac. Well, I wouldn't drive a Cadillac even if I had the money to do it. I'm being honest. I don't care, right? The facts of the matter is it's not about what I'm going to get. It's about obedience to the word so the church can flourish. Because if there is everything that's coming in like it should be, we can go and do more and outreach more. That's right. But when we don't do what God said to do, then the church begs. And the pastor has to feed the church. And I'm talking about the bills and all of that. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So we're really shooting ourselves in the foot. We want, we want the church to grow. But we're not going to do our part so they can. Right. Oh, Pastor, when are we going to get off this? I don't know. We don't have, I mean, I don't know how much more we got, but we got some more to go. Why? We have to get this in our spirits. You can't jump over this portion and expect to be making it, you know, we're going to, oh, we're going now. Every, that child is going to have to learn how to take one step and then take another and take another. It can't just jump over that and say, okay, I'm crawling and now I'm going to start driving a car. I don't need that walking thing. I'm, it's not important. <laughs> She's up. <definitely> terrifying. <laughs> Some of y'all are terrifying even if you're not the children. <laughs> Some of y'all have made them stiff. I'm talking about myself. All right. Who's got 1 Timothy 5 and 18? Go ahead. All right, there again, a second witness. Everybody know that, right? The Bible says, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And once again, Timothy, he says, don't muzzle the ox, tread out the corn, and that the laborer is worthy of his hire, right. worthy of the reward. If you're working in the house of the Lord, there should be a reward for you, whether it's spiritual, naturally. All right? Hebrews 7, Hebrews seven uh, 5, five, five okay. through 9. And verily they that are of the sons of Levi who receiveth the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law that is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descendant is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is better of uh, the less is blessed of the better. All right. So once again, it's saying that. The Levite or the priesthood yep. is supposed to command it. Right. See, that's where I'm I'm not in obedience right now with it. 
What about you? Why don't you be an obedience pastor? How can I be? How can I command to take of the tithes and the tithes don't come? Mm. See, I got I got whoops at the convention over this. So why would you why would you dare be pastor in church and not taking something because it's commanded for you as a as the priest to take from your brother, commanded for you to receive. And if well commanded to take is what it said, of your brother. Even though you're of the same seed, you have a different place than they have. That's what the book says. I didn't make that up. And I got beat up, boy, down there commission. You know what the you know what the bishop said? He said, when I got this, he said, what I did was I told the church they're gonna pay my light bill. Out the ties. That's what he said. For my house. He said, we have never paid a light bill since. Is that what he said? We should pastor me. He wasn't trying to get, but he, he said, I gotta follow something. This is what the book says. <clears throat> Otherwise, I'm not in obedience. I haven't started that, but we're starting it. I'm going to find something of our household bills that the church is going to pay. Bill, I can tell you that right now. And he said, every person in his church, every person in his church that were all living in apartments, live with families, every person in his church, you can, I'll give you his number, you can call. Every person in his church is a homeowner now. Mm -hmm. On their own home. He said, you shouldn't be as a person of God, you shouldn't be an apartment dweller. I'd like to not be. You can't be. You can't be. You have your own house. God can do it. He said every person in his place. What did he say? Six million dollars? That Fannie Mae, he brought in a, a mortgage company. They showed him how to get their uh, credit scores up mm -hmm. and then help them get loans to get in their houses. He said, not one person in my church doesn't have their own home or is you know, buying their own home. He said, we're supposed to possess in the land. He said, he still had been cursed apartment dwelling. I did it the other day. You should have whatever you want from the Lord when you're doing what you're supposed to do. Well, I just don't know how to do it. Have you asked about how to get your credit up? Come see me. We got sick. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about you specifically. I'm talking about people. Just people. There are steps that we can take in this world. God is going to benefit us, and he's going to bless us to do what we need to do. You want God to bless your family? He's going to do it. I believe. Why? Because my motive ain't wrong, and I believe God. You should have your own place. Where you ain't got to worry about somebody beating on the ceiling or whatever. Oh, yeah. She said, I don't smoke, but my house smells like smoke. Because all the folks can't even open up my windows. We have, you know? we have that problem with weed, man. The house gets skunky at times. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't be there. Well, I know why people smoke weed. <laughs> It's pretty simple. <laughs> All right. It is recommended that the students read the uh, observe carefully the three stewardship parables given by Jesus. This can be given as homework assignment. The parables are as follows. Now, if you have these books, write them down and go home and read these. 
You got your books. It's on page 15 at the bottom. I would like to have everybody read those parables. Okay. Gotcha. You got your book. This is his room book. Blow the dust off of it. <laughs> All right. So glad that we had this time to, to do some more studying in stewardship. Thank you for joining us again and tuning into our podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you want to find more lessons like these, you can visit our Facebook page, Apostolic Church of Jesus Christ. We are located at 614 North Franklin Avenue, Sand Springs, Oklahoma, if you would like to attend service. God bless.